There we go. <clears throat> Great. Good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. My name is Adam Harris. I am from Trade with Precision and I am a chief market analyst and I will be your trader slash presenter for today. So first thing I want to do is make sure that you can hear me. I do that you can hear me. I'm going to switch on my camera on uh, GoToWebinar. And if you can also let me know if you can see me on that. Um, it looks a little bit odd from my side. It doesn't appear to be showing anything. So that's why I'm not convinced it actually is doing that. But also because my camera is showing up on, is being used by different apps. So it might actually have a clash with that. Anyway, for those, uh, for my colleagues who are checking the streaming on uh, OBS, please let me know how that is going. So welcome to today's webinar, the title of which is, it's part of the Trading fundamental series uh, and I've got it here as 12 critical techniques for new traders. Um, let me just check something here. It's actually meant to be tying it all together. And there's a risk disclaimer. I'm going to just check something here as well before we continue. Yeah, that's what I've got here. Foundations of successful. I want to check something else as well. Same one. Why have I got this? This appears to be the same thing, which is not correct. Why is this one? the same. Okay. I'm afraid I'm going to have to go with that for now. Um, so that's fine. We'll just proceed with this, but bring it all together appears to be the wrong slide deck, which is uh, not what I was looking for today, but it doesn't matter. We've got quite a bit of core stuff to cover and actually I'll have a look at what the items are in the, in the agenda at the moment and I'll make sure that I cover those anyway. Um, so there's a risk this game. I need to give you an opportunity to go through. Um, and uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to give you some background behind who I am. I am, as I said, I'm a chief market analyst. I'm also a trader. So I day trade in the mornings. And I day trade in the mornings. I'm just, uh, my dog likes to chew her bed. And of course, this she's going to eat the stuffing, which is not what I want. So I usually day trade in the mornings, which is the UK session, which overlaps with the the Asia session, which is actually right now, we can go through and have a look at a couple of charts. There's actually a few charts that I want to show you that I think are very interesting at the moment. I then might look at the US session, might look at the US session, and then also potentially look at the end of day charts as well, the daily charts. And that's usually at around about somewhere between 6.30 p.m. and let's say 9.30 p.m. UK time. So basically very close to when that daily candle is closing, looking on the daily time frame for anything. And the reason I do this is because sometimes my days can be a bit organic in terms of what happens in non-trading activities such as, I don't know, walking the dogs or having to do chores or get something fixed or go out it does interfere with my ability to just focus and sit in front of the charts of day trade. So I might have to skip the session. But there's usually multiple setups in a week, uh, if not on a daily basis, depending on which session I manage to uh, get involved in. So uh, that is it. I trade anything that is moving. Okay, so multiple time frame analysis and placing your first trade as well. Um, so fantastic. We're going to talk about multiple time frame analysis. That's really uh, what it's going to be. Um, that is the part of tying it all together. So we've got all these previous things. So actually, this is what I'm going to use today as my uh, frame of reference. I'm going to come back to this and then uh, I'll make sure that we, uh, I'll just log the issue with a slide deck. But a couple of things that I just want to point out here. So for those of you, if this is your very first session, if this is your very first session, uh, and this is part of a series that rotates. You've got um, obviously the foundations of successful trading as part one, then understanding price action as part two. Part three is how to use indicators and part four is putting it all together, which is taking everything you've covered up until that point and then adding multiple time frame analysis as well before you pull the trigger. So uh, what I want to do is I'm going to do a recap of all of that very quickly and make sure that we then include multiple time frame analysis so that that all makes sense to you. First of all, when we look at asset class exploration, this is the beauty of technical trading from my perspective. When we look at the charts, regardless of the asset class, they are almost all identical in terms of the behavior and the structures that we find within them. And that is principally because it's always humans behind that. And so the greed and the fear um, and the speculation uh, and the panic, all those things are pretty much universal. So within that, obviously, you've got a few core professionals who are very experienced with what they do, so we're capable of taking advantage of it. 
one of the ways I want you to think of it is, imagine that um, anyone who's watching today is surely familiar with either a cat or a dog. Hopefully all of you are familiar with cat or dog personalities. And it's interesting because obviously we get different types of dogs as well. But the thing is that we can recognize dog traits. For the most part, most dogs have certain characteristics that we think of as a dog characteristic. So even if we meet a dog we've never met before, there's a very good chance we would still be able to recognize and interact with that animal, rub its belly, for example, or speak to it in such a way that it would respond in a very similar fashion. So that's the way in which technical analysis can be applied to any particular instrument out there. It has certain characteristics. And even if we look at a chart we haven't looked at before, the characteristics tend to surface and repeat doesn't matter the kind of market. So there are some subtle differences between, say, for example, currencies or commodities and the indices. But then within that, a lot of the behaviors are identical. All right. And so the purpose of asset class exploration from a technical trader's perspective is we would look through all of the charts and look for a really strong trend. So the first thing I'm going to do here is look, and again, we'll come to the trading psychology and risk management parts in a moment. Let's go through here and we're going to start to run through the charts. All I'm going to do quickly is create a chart, a fresh chart, and we're going to be looking for a trend. Okay, so just going to quickly show you, I'm going to build a case to take a trade. Uh, and so all I'm going to do here is go with plain candles. There we go. Nothing else on this, remove everything else. And all I'm looking for, <clears throat> for example, on the daily time frame, is going to be a strong trend. So in order to show you, I think what I'm going to do as well is show you what a really good trend looks like very quickly and what a very bad trend looks like. In other words, a no-go area. And then we can start to work our way through some of the charts so we can get a sense of that. And this does take practice. When you're a newer trader, one of the first things you need to master, in my opinion, is the ability to recognize money-making conditions. So in other words, strong, healthy momentum in a market. And that provides higher probability, safer trading opportunities, money-making opportunities. We shouldn't, money's not a dirty word. We shouldn't shy away from saying it. Our goal here, ladies and gentlemen, is to earn a primary or secondary source of income. And I've had a bumper month. I can actually very quickly show you what a real account looks like. So let's just go over here. This is a, a, an account that I manage for a friend of mine. And it's just had a, we've just had the most bumper month over here. Um, this is my best month to date and I want to see if I can hit 19% before the end of the day. We'll have to see how that goes. Um, it's been a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal kind of month from that perspective. But it also gives you a sense of what realistic kind of uh, earnings can be. The reason the initial growth is very little, funnily enough, is not so much to do with compounding. Um, it's actually to do with I was risking 0.25 to 0.5%. So I know that's a, a quarter to half a percent per trade on every trade I was taking. So I was risking a lot less, whereas now I'm starting to risk a lot more. I never, ever risk more than 1%. It's not my thing. Um, I usually risk half a percent to 1% share, and you can see the differences as it starts to kind of pick up on that. And part of the reason I did that was because uh, I don't generally manage money for other people. I only trade for myself. And so I wanted to get the, my friend accustomed to how the account would look, and I was sort of doing my own thing on my own accounts and then secondary trading on his. And then eventually I just started to, to attach it, copy trade it uh, to my one. That's not a solicitation, by the way. Um, but yeah, this is one of the things that I really do. So it shows you the kind of returns that you can look to get. And really the last couple of months have been phenomenal. November and December, I had a couple of trades open that I should have just potentially have closed uh, because nothing really happened over December. And November I had trades that were open here that eventually have closed in January. So some of the profit, the reason it's also such a big month is because some of the profit is coming from trades that were still open throughout November and December and are only closing out now. All right, so that just wants to, I just wanted to give you a sense of that. Okay, that being said, let's go back to the chart. Let's have a look at what a really good trend looks like. Let me just go through and find something with an outstanding trend and then we can, uh, then we can start to kind of take it from there. So the first thing I'm doing is looking for a good quality trend. That's not a bad one. Overall, this is really good. It's got better sections. It has some sections that I would qualify as very good. 
um, sections of it like this that are very, very nice. This is also not bad. This is very good. And overall, there's a bigger trend at play here as well. So there's trends within trends. Looks really good. Let's just see what uh, the question is there. When I'm risking half a percent, is it per trade or overall risk? It's per trade. That's a fantastic question, and it is per trade. And the reason I do that, and this is the psychology, I was going to come back to that, is that uh, it, it for me, I have worked out where my where my comfort zone is. So I would rather have less per trade and lots of trades on, because then I know that I'm going to be net profitable. So it's a great question. Thank you. So also looking here to see if I can find, let me just run through natural gas at some very strong trends to the downside. Let's just do that. Um, gas, I wanna see if I could, that's a great section. This is a beautiful section. This is what we refer to as optimal price action, where it's just a very, very, very steady, steady flow. Then you can get, then you can, you know, where it's absolutely very just smooth. That you know, that would be optimal price action. You can get other versions of the same thing, where the corrections are a little bit deeper, but overall, it's still nice and smooth. You even sometimes get something like this, but overall, the point is that the structure stands out to you. You can see it. So possibly, what's going through your head is you're thinking, well, in my experience, every time I find you know, finally finds something that has good structure to it, it just, it ends. It ends the day I take a trade in it. Then I'm right at the, that's, you know, that's my luck. That's kind of what happens. So that's partially true. There's actually a reason for that. The reason for that is that in the beginning, when we're very untrained, we need a lot of evidence. We need a lot of visually obvious stuff for our brains to be able to recognize it. So it has to be really obvious for our brains to then go, oh, there's a trend because our eyes aren't trained at recognizing it. But the good news is that's your starting point. It only gets better from that point onwards. You start to be able to recognize trends, not just variations of the trends. You start to see that, that there is trend in a little bit of noise, but, and this is the beauty of it, is you start to be able to recognize it sooner, sooner and sooner and sooner. So you start to recognize it. <clears throat> you know, at first you, you only see it. So at first you only see it here. That's when you finally recognize the trend that pulls back here. And then of course you have a losing trade. But then one day you start to recognize it in this area. So you got a little bit further down. Then you start to recognize it here. Then you start to recognize it here. Then you get to a point where you see it here. Then you get to a point where you start to see it here. And eventually the big kahuna, you start to be able to recognize it here. So it gets better, but you have to practice it. You have to become familiar with it. You need to know, you need to have looked at a thousand trains so that you know what a trend looks like at all stages. And they all have births, and then they all start to mature, and then they eventually all expire. So that's a very, that's an example of a great, a, a pretty good trend. I'm just gonna quickly run through and see if there's anything else while I'm looking for anything that we might have now. Um, looking at sugar, I mean, this is ridiculous. The one that just falls off a cliff, you can't necessarily catch stuff like that all the time. There's a great trend. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Okay, Coca-Cola. Is that right? No, it's Coca, sorry. Coca, I have, I didn't sleep very well last night. I only fell asleep at 4.30 this morning. That never happens. I don't know why, so I'm still waking up. I apologize. So uh, that's beautiful. A couple of things I want to show you. I'm going to show you some, well, just tell you about some sort of master tips here. The angle of price is important as well. So you've got an angle there, you've got a bit of an angle there, and then the angle starts to increase. Okay, so there is the angle is starting to increase. And when it becomes too, when it starts hitting towards vertical, then it's starting to like, it's starting to bubble. And we call that parabolic. And usually that means that somewhere, in its future, it's gonna run out of steam and it's usually gonna have a correction. And this is where it gets interesting. The correction brings it back in line with the original general version of the trend. Okay, so chances are that when this does have a correction, uh, it's gonna come back down into about this area, which means it'll probably come back down to where these highs are. So we'll have to see when that happens. Okay, so, um, the, if it's sideways, if the market's going sideways, there's no real momentum. It's in a bit of a coma. So it's going largely sideways. As it starts to pick up pace, this is very sustainable. It's a very gentle slope. It's very good. 
that's starting to become a very strong trend now. It's starting to become ridiculously uh, sort of aggressive. Once it gets up to something like this, it's it's going to eventually going to. When I say it's going to crash, it's going to have a big correction at the end of it, and it always has a big correction. Um, with there's very few exceptions to that. I would say Nvidia um, has done that. We can look. Nvidia is a good example of having gone parabolic. Looks okay. Nasdaq has had a beautiful correction. I can show you that as well in a moment. And same thing to the downside. Same thing to the downside. It's flat like this, then it starts to build up, and eventually it goes down really steep. It's sort of falling off a cliff, as I said, and that momentum is very big. So you've got to, th I mean, that's it makes perfect sense when you think about it, because it's not going anywhere. If it's just going sideways, it's pretty much in a coma. And if it's, you know, and then as it picks up that angle of momentum. So there's a certain angle that I, or range that I think is relatively sustainable, meaning that it's not bubble forming and it's very nice and healthy. And it's kind of somewhere between these two, those two angles there. Okay, so pretty cool. Um, so that's a that's a really good song. Now let's have a look at something that's terrible that you wouldn't touch with a ten foot barge pole. Some of the Swissy ones are looking like that. This is uh, not a bad example. Not a bad example. Just that range overall very messy. Okay, Swissy doesn't look great, but this type of patch as well. If, if price is kind of doing this, we don't really want to touch it. I call it garbage, which sometimes offends people, but it, it really is. And it's okay to be picky. This is like one of the things where I think it does pay to be picky. There's nothing happening here. So you can just walk away from stuff like this. And here's, I want to take a moment here. I want to pause and just kind of say something. Um, our job, and this might help, our job as traders is not to try to find market conditions, any market conditions, like randomly pick an instrument, for example, Euro dollar, and then try to guess what it's going to do next. We don't, based off like with no real information. What we do as traders is we go through the charts until we find any chart which is producing at some stage, a, either the just about to produce a pattern or in the early stages of producing a pattern <clears throat> that we know is likely to complete a certain way. So a head and shoulders or a double bottom uh, or a double top or inverted head and shoulders or any other kind of a strategy that is out there. So we look until we, we go through the charts until we recognize that there's a pattern that is forming that we can take advantage of. And then we place our entry and our stop loss on either side of that particular pattern. And then we wait for it to trigger and to then complete, which has a very high probability of making us money. So trading is really also about finding a set of conditions, which is already in play. It's already in play and you want to get a piece of that. That's really important, which is why when we look for trending markets, we can usually already uh, start to engage in it. It's not so much about looking at a chart like this and going, well, I think it's going to break up here and therefore uh, I'm going to put an entry there and I'm going to just buy. And this is where you get caught in that deadly trap when you hear about people who lose money doing this. That's the kind of approach they do. And it's usually driven Here's a great example, something like gold, and that somebody said to them, hedge, it's a hedge against inflation, which it's not, which is bollocks. It's not at all. And so they buy gold because it's doing this, which is actually a no-go thing, but they buy. And then it goes down because it's not a hedge against inflation. Gold is used for a myriad of other things. Hedge against inflation is probably 20 down the list. All right, we had the greatest global inflation in the last couple of years that we've had in decades and gold tanked and the reason it tanked is because it's more impacted by the us dollar what the us dollar is doing than it is by inflation per se okay so we need to clarify that there are urban myths out there so my point is we wait until we find conditions that are already in play and then we take advantage of that that's where the, the probabilities are on our side um, Cool. So that's a good example of trend, good trend versus no trend versus don't touch me. I'm crazy right now. Don't touch me. Don't come near me, which is this kind of stuff as well. So that being said, let's look at gold. Let's see what's going on with gold. So, okay. So gold had a trend. Gold had a trend. There was a general downtrend here. Then it started an uptrend here which then proceeded to produce 
series of a lower high, but don't worry about that because that we still have so far higher lows. So the uptrend is still intact, but it has lost its mojo. And in a way, what's actually forming here so far is a little bit of a wedge. And there's a good chance it's going to break out soon to the upside. There's a potential trading setup like right now. Okay, so let me take you through it. So first of all, let's... Now somebody's saying to me, they put a gun to my head and they said, Adam, I want you to trade gold. Okay, so all right, I will because you told me to. No, not because you told me to, because I, because I want to, something like that. So I'm just going to do this. Now, this is not really meant to be a very fixed line. Don't worry about it too much. I'm just putting it there. I just want to kind of show you, generally speaking, that if price is above this level, it's bullish. If it's below that level, it's bearish. And it started to break up to the upside here. So it's definitely not below this level anymore. So it's breaking out, showing signs of bullishness. Overall, you did this with me. We saw this general trend. Okay, I just did that to connect those two lower highs. We had lower highs, lower low, lower high, lower high. We had a lower high, lower low, don't worry about that. Then we had a lower low. So actually, these are the two main ones. So actually, this structure is really this. And again, that takes practice for your brain to be able to see both the bigger picture and the smaller picture. And that is multiple time frame analysis. Okay, it's not just multiple time frame analysis, but your brain, and this takes a while. You've got to practice this. It's called extrapolation. The ability for your brain to see both the bigger picture from the smaller picture and the smaller picture from the bigger picture. In other words, I know if this is a daily, so we're doing everything on the daily here, that if we go down here, I know what that four hour is going to look like. That four hour is going to look like this. I know it because my I've gone zoomed into those types of conditions before. So my brain already knows how to guess what it's going to look like below that. And also, if I'm on the four hour, my brain can guess what it's going to look like on the daily. So that takes a bit of practice. So the next thing we've discovered is that we have, we broke this downtrend. Okay, we broke it. So that downtrend doesn't exist anymore. Price then came up here and broke above those highs and above that high. So what I want you to think about then is the story of what's happening in the market. So we've got a high over here. So I'm going to just draw it across here. And then we've got another high over here. So what happened was price was going down. Then it came up and it broke above this high and it broke above that high there because we can draw a line across. And then it also broke above this high, which means that the market was now exploring new highs. It's exploring it. It doesn't matter how it is, whether it's money make, uh, whether it's market makers or whether it's retail pushing it there or speculators, it doesn't matter. It's a crowd behavior. So imagine you went to a conference. So you went to one of these, like Comic-Con. So in America, I mean, I used to be in the film business and there was, there were like, NFB was uh, like the film and broadcasting, which was, you could go there and look at all the latest cameras and recording equipment and stuff. And that was boring. But then there was like special effects stuff, which is called SIGROP, special, special interest group, gra graphics group, group for graphics, sorry. And that was like, you could go there and see how they did. Well, when I went, it was like Independence Day and you know, Jurassic Park 2, and you could go there and meet all the people and see all the software and all the amazing stuff. And Comic-Con, you can go to Comic-Con and you can see all the latest stuff. So while you're there as a retail person with your pocket money and you're going to go and, oh, I'm going to buy a nice t-shirt or I'm going to buy this toy or I'm going to buy this software, you know, in my little home studio budget type of thing, while you're doing that, there's companies browsing around saying, we, you know, so I want to buy a thousand of those machines or a thousand seats of software. Pixar's over there doing Toy Story 2, and I want to go, this is what my life was like before I did what I did, what I do now. Uh, and so this, what I mean is that at this, in this location, which is a marketplace, there's people selling stuff, there's people buying stuff, deals are being made, deals are being made for one person buying one little seat or something, and deals are made, being made for a company to buy 50 seats of something, you know, $100,000 software, massive deals being made. It's the same in this market. There are retail traders such as you and me. There are institutions, hedge funds, mutual funds, which have obligations such as BlackRock um, to their clients <coughs> for their products to buy certain things. To take action, you've got um, Berkshire Hathaway, um, and you've, you've got big deals and small deals all happening within the same marketplace. Okay, 
Uh, and so just understand that the, we, we can often think we're all operating in isolation. And let me tell you something now, big institutions can do dumb things as well as newer traders. They can do really dumb things. One of them is one of my, used to be one of my favorites was Kathy Wood's ARC. Kathy Wood has historically has done and made the absolute worst decisions. She consistently, as a, if it was a technical trader, they'd be fired. She gets in right at the top of a move, buys right at the top of a move. She did this in, within, with um, NVIDIA in 2021, something bought right at the top. And then when it tanked, as, as did everything else in the market, she then sold out <coughs> just before it rallied and look at where it is now, All right? And so please understand that although there are lots of professionals out there, big institutions or big companies also employ people who can make mistakes. And also they can get stuck in their own way of thinking. They can get corporate mindsets. They can make bad decisions. So I want you to understand that, that that's how you get bubbles forming when companies and individuals can all start drinking the same Kool-Aid. It happens. So back to this. We see price breaks above here and breaks above that. So the market's now testing new highs. But the market has to do retracements. It has to go push, pull, extension, retracement, extension, retracement. So after it breaks through here, it pulls back and it pulls, it produces a high low here and then goes up and breaks above this. So it's definitely in an uptrend. Test new highs over here. Then it comes back, does a breather, does another move up. So it goes up to these highs here, comes down, produces a high low here, comes up here. So the point is that at this point, yeah, it's battling a little bit. Gold is battling a little bit here. Comes down. Still tries to do a little bit here, but these are the high lows. Here's a low, there's a big low, there's a big low. At this point, it comes down it, and produces a little bit of a swing low here, which goes up here, then it comes here, and then it goes up here. So, so far, it hasn't broken this low. So, on the way up, it hasn't, it's doing this now, but it hasn't broken that low. And it's still operating above that level. So gold is still more bullish than it is bearish. Then it's producing a small little temporary downtrend here, but now it's produced an uptrend. So let's see what's happening here. Here it's gone from this low to this high, to this higher low, to this high. It has, believe it or not, gone back into an uptrend. So we study, so technical traders will study trends, we're studying price, so that we can pay attention to what is it doing now within the context of its story. I wanted to show you all of this, not because all of this matters. As you get, again, as you get more and more experienced, the less information you need to be able to know what's going on. So all I really needed to do was see about that much. I only needed to see that much, this much, because by that time, I can see we've shifted into an uptrend and that we've broken through that downtrend. So that's two things that's happened and that we're above this level, so that's three. So it's still, it's down and uptrend, it's stayed above this level, so maybe I needed a bit more information, maybe I needed that much information. But also I can see it's in a bit of a wedge, just starting to break out through that wedge. So what now? How about uh, taking a trade? Well, cool. There's another thing that the market tends to do a lot of, these patterns that repeat themselves. So it'll produce a high, it'll go back up, it comes back down, it'll often come back and test that and carry on, so it's like a break and a retest, break and a retest. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it carries on and there's a gap between those two things. Sometimes that happens. But what has it done here? It's actually done a bit of a break and a retest. It's just broken up through this, broken up through those highs. It's pushing through that. <clears throat> and so we can go in and have a look at it. We don't even need this stuff anymore now. And actually it really is good for you to have less on your chart than more stuff on your chart. So we don't really need anything else that's necessarily happening here. And I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm showing you the market structure. So the purest information you can have on your screen is just the candlesticks. Your goal, your mission, should you choose to accept it as you become a master trader, is to have less and less and less on your screen. But you, you can do that because over time, you've seen everything. I've taken thousands of trades and I've seen everything. So I don't, my brain now is very familiar with the way markets move and I need less, only need to look at less because my brain is probably absorbing. I don't know if you've ever had this. Not everyone drives around the world, especially in, the, in London. If you live in London, not a lot of people drive. But if you've been driving for a very long time, you often have these situations where you can tell that the car in front of you is intending to turn, even though they haven't put the indicators on. You sense it because they do a lot of small, minimal, minimal kind of things that you detect their behavior 
is something's up and then of course they end up turning off <clears throat> so there's lots of little things that you pick up to experience it allows you to predict to a high degree what the market's going to do um so that's the kind of thing we're looking at here so let's zoom in we're going to the four hour so first thing i want to do is go back to the daily and let's have a look i'm going to put a level here so this level is just where you can see it's failed to break through in those areas here, but it has managed to break above those. Now I'm gonna go down to the four hours so that you can see this area. So we're gonna focus now purely on this little area here. So let's go down to the four hours so you can see where we are. And here you can see price has managed to break through, retest this and is trying to, to go. <clears throat> so let's recap where we are. We've picked a market where I think there's a valid opportunity it's not the most perfect trend but it has enough pattern price action behavior and pattern and a potential setup that it's a good example for me to take you through so we know the direction in which it's going and the reason we know this is because we've looked at 20 different things that tell us that we could see it wasn't a downtrend then it went into an uptrend it's managed to keep series of high lows it's broken through the downward sloping trend line it stayed above the upward sloping trend line it's just like there's more bullish stuff if you go to the weekly you can also see here, if I move this down a bit, down here, you can see there's a bit of a break and a retest as well. It's done a swing low. So it's staying above, <clears throat> let's call it 2025 or 2020. Uh, in fact, the lowest point at which it was was probably close to the round number 2000, which is right there. So that's actually what it did. It's staying above 2000. We can also see, if you look, you can see it's battling in this area in general. So this is the danger zone. So anyway, up here, it's battling to get through it. Eventually, it's going to break through. Eventually, it is going to break through. We know this, but right now, it's battling. So that, so this is good that I'm showing you this because when you go up to the higher time frame, imagine that you on a hike. You're hiking in the woods, and you have a drone with you, and you get lost. So you don't know where you are. You have, haven't seen any signs of civilization for hours. <clears throat> So you send your drone up. So as your drone goes up and further up and you look through your, your visor, whether it's your mask or through your phone or your iPad or whatever, as the drone goes up, it sees you get smaller and smaller and smaller and it sees the trees around you, for example. Then it's, you see a stream or a river you know, in the distance and, and maybe a landmark rock. Then as it goes further away, uh, eventually maybe, it, I don't know, it sees that there's a, there's a bigger river that the stream runs into. And as it pulls further and further and further and goes further into the sky, so maybe it's up a one or two kilometers up, then you can see there's a village, maybe a village or a town um, or a camping spot, whatever, that, you, that that's maybe where you're trying to head to in the distance. So as you zoom out, you get perspective. You can see where you are and you can see where everything else is in relation to you. And that's what going up the higher time frames does. It gives us a sense of perspective, especially when it comes to significant price levels. So multiple time frame analysis is that zooming out and down. So you go up and down. So what happens is you go down for more detail and you go up for big picture stuff. And so here the big picture stuff, especially when we go to the monthly, it helps me see, I can see the area we're in is an area that gold has struggled with in the past. But I can also see that this time the behavior is different. It's battling. It isn't, I'll tell you what's actually happening here. It's interesting. This was the first area where gold hit encountered sellers. So on the way up, when you hit all-time highs, it's very prudent to take partial profits when you come up to a big number, $2,000. $2,000 an ounce. Gold, never, maybe never been there before. $2,000 is a big round number. It's the easiest place to just look. You know what? I'm going to take all my profit off the table at $19.99. Other experienced traders are going, I expect when we get up there, there's probably going to be some sellers that are going to push back. So I'm going to get ready to sell if I see if I see any rejection in that area. So you start to see some rejection in the area, and so sellers jump in. So not only this is important, not only do the the bulls take profit. So when they get out, they are selling their positions. There are other traders that want to get in that take those positions on the other side. So they sell. Um, so those buys are replaced with sells, and so the momentum shifts. The, it loses buying power and it gains sellers in the process. And so it goes down. So there's a shorting opportunity. The second time it comes back up, if there's a similar reaction, which there almost always is, there's at least two times where it does this. So if price hits an all-time and has a correction, the second time 
it, there's a very high probability experienced traders will know this that you'll have a second sell off um, in that at least in terms of a risk and probabilities thing is probably going to happen after that then we'll have to see how it goes so the second sell off is even heavy here because people <coughs> more people clue in they realize okay there's going to be a, there's going to be a sell off here and so they capture some of this move they're not capturing nobody nobody can consistently consistently capture every pip of every move they can't sell buy here and sell there nobody never met anyone could do it doesn't exist in the market wizard series books doesn't happen it's not real but you can usually count on a certain move so someone would get in here put their stop loss there and take three to one and so there is a certain distance a minimum distance they expect it to go but then they know that after that well we'll have to see <clears throat> so in this particular case this becomes a danger zone so you get a bit of a selling area here and then another sell and then another sell but now price is broken through the thing is is that price also went up to here and had a sell it wasn't just that it couldn't close above let's call it sort of 1990 it couldn't quite close above that it was able to get across but then it had it, and it failed to close above that so basically this is the start of what i'm going to call the danger zone couldn't close above that point until now until here so this is the danger zone but it also got rejected here and here and here which means this whole area not just one area not just this level here but all this level but all of it just contain a lot of heavy selling we've managed to move and close into those areas now but now it went up and it hits another high here so there are lots of sellers in this area lots of sellers and again it'll have it'll include some institutions maybe some hedge funds maybe some high net worth traders um maybe some mining companies for example they might have been holding gold for here or holding it over here and now they finally want to get some profit so they you know they're up in profit they close out those positions it's a whole range of different things that can happen the point i want to show you is that there are multiple levels of danger here which is not that common so and we're still not free of it but eventually what will happen what will happen is that it will eventually battle its way through and probably start to settle into a trend okay but it hasn't managed to get through that area yet. so what is so why i'm telling you this is because this falls under our analysis which then goes to our risk we can visually see where there are rocks here it's like we're trying to navigate around <clears throat> excuse me the southern tip of of africa which is was called the cape of storms so many ships got sunk there they couldn't get past there's rocks and all kinds of things right it's windy and stormy so we're trying to navigate through that we know that there are dangerous areas we still have to get through but we are managing to get to it it is managing to push through and so we can take a trade but this this is important because we can we know that we're in a treacherous area and therefore there's risk on this trade so that means right off the bat it means probably i wouldn't go one percent on a trade here excuse my my nose is itchy I wouldn't go to the full 1% or the full risk amount on this trade because of that treacherousness. But I still believe that I can see where the market wants to go and I think that there's potentially worth taking a trade. So that pertains to my assessment of the, the smoothness of how this trade is going to play out. There's risk attached. So I'm going to reduce my risk budget for this trade. That's one another tick in the box. I'm showing you how we build up to do this, how experience plays out. Then I've got to figure out where my entry is, and then I've got to figure out where I should put my stop loss. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a tip here. Every single trade, every single trade uh, that we do as retail traders usually falls into one of two categories. It's either through a pullback or breakout, meaning as the market is moving, there's a pullback, so we can get in on the pullback, or there'll be a breakout as it breaks to new highs. So you're either getting in here or you're getting in somewhere on the pullback, which actually means anywhere along here is acceptable. Some traders like to get in on breakouts to a new high, for example, and some, or breakout to a new low, go the other way around, pullback, breakout. That's the very last place you wanna get in. The pullback is the sweet spot. But different traders have different strategies and different comfort zones, different things they wanna do. <clears throat> So arguably, we've just had our breakout here. So we know roughly where our entry is going to be. 
uh, where it is kind of now, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Technically, I mean, price is just, if I was gonna get in the breakouts, it would probably be somewhere in this area. So we're not that far from where our entry would legitimately be. The next thing is that where would I put my stop loss? Now, market structure is really the safest thing. Market structure tells me that if I put my stop loss here or here, it's protected by some, you can see it's protected by the market structure. Right, that's beautiful. As a technical thing, that's amazing because the market has found support in those areas. If the market drops below this area now, if it does, then clearly the market, then this whole thing that I had going all the way up here and all these levels of support have failed. So if it does do that, it's failed, which means I want to get out. So having losing trades is annoying, but knowing when to get out, in other words, you want to get out the absolute soonest point you can as soon as you know for sure this trade's not gonna go your way. So the next part of that is that there are, there's usually one or two places where our stop loss can be. They are both valid, okay? I guess I was about to say something like stop loss placement is a participation sport, absolutely, or activity. So I can put my stop loss below this swing low here. I can do that, that is valid. I can put it below this swing low as well. That's also valid. So you might be going, well, Adam, surely only one of those is the right one. No, they're both right. There are consequences, but in other words, there will be differences in the results between them, but they are both acceptable. In fact, my stop loss being put here is also acceptable and here and here but that's getting ridiculous putting it down here is absolutely ridiculous your goal again your goal through experience if experience or strategy or data hard proof whatever you have is to get your stop loss as close as you can to your entry for a couple of reasons it maximizes your profit in other words putting my stop loss here if my entry is here that means that becomes what's known as my risk my r that means that if I get it to there, that's one R, it's called one R. So I make one times my risk, which is 1% profit or whatever. So if I risk 2%, I make 2%. If I risk half a percent, I make half a percent, it's one R. If my stop loss is here and my entry is here, then all of a sudden it's bigger, which means that I have to go here to make it. And the further out I have to go to make my profits, the more time is allowed for things to change, conditions to change. So maybe I can get up here in three or four candles, but if I have to go up further up here, then it's suddenly I need eight or nine or 10 candles, and that just leaves more time for conditions to change. So I don't want my target to be far away. In fact, I really want my target to be as close as possible or for me to just get more out of that distance. So the tighter my entry is to my stop loss, if I think this is as far as I can safely go, in other words, I think I'm pretty sure we're gonna make it up to here. After that, I think it's gonna battle. So for me, this is high probability profits. High probability profits, low probability profits. Do I have to close out my position now? No, I don't, that is an option. Okay, so we were talking about that. Notice how I started actually talking about stop loss first. Started looking at where can I put my stop loss first? And so I did that. So your goal as you become a more experienced trader is how close can I bring my stop loss without being silly, without exposing it to getting stopped in. If I have my entries here and my stop loss is here, right by my entry one pip away, I'm potentially gonna get nailed. I'm asking for it. So I don't really wanna do that. I wanna bring my stop loss as close as I can because if my stop loss is closer, then this becomes a four to one, for example, or a three to one. Same entry, same entry, but better stop loss location. So as you get more and more experienced, what you really get better at is you get better at better entries and better stop loss placements, which means that you are able to milk more profits out of the same move that everybody else is going for. So that is a valid stop loss, that's a valid stop loss. I wouldn't go further than that because after that, it makes the whole trade not really worth my while. I think we have the greatest probability of the market coming up here. So I think it's pretty much a given that I'm gonna make this money, this. This is a real trade idea, by the way, that I'm pretty much a given that I can make money on this trade. However, once it gets past there, I'm not so sure about that. So one of the things I could do is take some money off the table, take two thirds of the money off the table, half the money, two thirds of the money off the table, 
and then wait for it to see how it reacts. And if it does break through and keep going, then I'm still in on the trade. And if it comes back and stops out, so I'm going to be bringing my stop loss from behind to trap it from underneath. And I'm also going to be taking some profit as it goes. That's very clever. I've taken a trade that has definite risk attached. It doesn't have a free run infinitely cannot just go there's no there is massive resistance up ahead but i think the momentum is going to push through to the upside so it's a valid trade idea but it has risks <clears throat> as a as a as an overall rating of the trade idea this is about a seven out of ten because of the risk all those risks i spoke about it it takes away from its from its value but it has a very high probability of happening anyway and that comes mainly from experience. <clears throat> so there we go. So that, that means that I would take lots of profit off here and let it run after that. That doesn't mean I can't take another trade. So let's just say that it breaks through here, comes back and sets up with a beautiful candle here that I can add. So I've still, I've still got 30% of the profits from the previous trade in place. I can also now move my stop loss to here and there's a new trade idea. And now I can get in and move. So another, I want to take a moment here in case you've never heard me speak before, or you've never heard me say this before. We're not investing now, ladies and gentlemen. This is not an investing activity. This is a trading activity. We want to compound. We want to exit our trades to bank the money, to get in so we can compound on our position. So we, we always have a short-term target. And that short-term target might be three to one, but we always do have an exit point where we think price is probably going to run out of steam and we close that trade. That's not the same as investing. With investing, you're looking to buy, you're looking to hold, you need to give it time to let it play out, and you wanna only, only participate in markets that tend to go up over time. So you wanna look at indices, you wanna look, those are your safest things, like that's a sure thing. If you trade a US index, there's about a 99% chance that if you get a good entry and a good stop loss on that, and you let it run up, you're going to be fine. You're going to make plenty of money. And that's an investment approach. So it's, it's buy and hold is no exit plan. But that's with cash that you don't need right now. As a trader, we're trying to earn a salary. We're trying to make money and to get paid. To get paid, we have to bank profits. And to bank profits, we have to close our positions. So we're looking for shorter term moves, something that's just going to go 50 pips today. Trade that bank at right. Move on to the next trade. So that's hard for some people. I'm not saying, I think everyone can learn to do this. I think trading is a learnable skill like learning a foreign language, playing a musical instrument or playing a professional sport. I think everybody can learn to do this, but how will they choose to do it? Do they trade the daily time frame? Do they swing trade? Do they day trade on the one minutes? And so they do all their trades in a 90 minute session and they're done. Everybody finds their sweet spot. Okay, so I might get a follow up set up here and I can add to this position and milk it. I might like to trade gold. Maybe that's the only thing I like trading because I'm comfortable, I feel like I know it. Give me one second here. Presenting. Okay, so um, that's it. So that's potentially how we could look to do it. Uh, okay, so we'd be looking for a break and a continuation. So there are different ways in which I could do it. A sloppy way of getting in would be to just buy now. Buy now, stop loss here, for example, and target here. It's a little bit sloppy. Ideally, I would be able to get a better entry. I'd be able to get any kind of a pullback or something slightly tighter. So let's go into the four hour. So this is a potential entry as well. It's also a little bit on the sloppy side. Buy now, buy where we are now, put my stop loss here. Now look what I've done. Yes, I mean, it's in its own way, it's valid. I put my stop loss here put my stop loss here, put my stop loss here. All of those have already given me a tighter stop loss, which means I'm potentially already gonna bank more out of that move. And that's on the four hour time frame. It's pretty good. Okay. And I don't think that's ridiculous. In fact, potentially that's the best way to do it. Potentially this, put my stop loss below this low. Excuse me, there or there. And it's already improved the situation. In a, in a perfect world, I would have got in here, maybe got in on, on one of these types of where it's a break and a retest. 
Okay, now if you use the moving averages, which have been covered in other webinars, you would have seen the 10 and 20 and 50 and stuff going on here. So you'd still have got the same setup. You've got the same setup the same way, just using other tools. So the reason we bring in Fibonacci levels or moving average levels is because they add additional, again, visual guides. They point you to look at certain things. So they help you see it because your eyes aren't that good. You've got like baby eyes right now. It's not, a, I'm making light of it, but we all have to go through it. Everybody does. Uh, let's go further down. So notice how we have this bullish candle right now. So let's go further down. Let's go down to the one hour. Okay, so this now looks a little bit slightly better. Again, you buy now and there's a, there's a, a stop there or you'll stop here. Also, there might even be a break and a retest. You might get another break and a retest. And if you did, you could get in here with your stop loss there or there. And all of a sudden, then you've really shrunk it down and you maximize your stuff. So in this situation, you get two types of traders. You'd get a trader who comes in and does his three to one and he's out. Doesn't care. He's like, yep, I can get my three to one and I am done. Or you get someone who's seen what's on the daily and gets in on a tighter entry and still uses the daily target as their end target. Two different types of traders. They have their reasons. Maybe that one person's just had a new baby. He's tired. He just wants to hit his target. He thinks if he hits his three to one and his three to one is here, he's got a very good chance of it being done. It'll be done in a few hours and he can just, and it can be done for the day. And it's still three to one. Okay. You might even get a hybrid. Someone who goes, okay, I'll take again, half the profit off, two thirds of the profit off, and then let it run up to here. So we've covered, I want to talk because we've got, we've got about seven minutes left. I want to talk about this. We've covered multiple time frame analysis to identify levels, to identify the trend. We've determined what the trend is doing. We've then discussed different types of entries on different types of time frames and different stop loss placements. And we've done that all within the context of, and we've spoken about, <coughs> excuse me, the risk of the trade. The risk of the trade, where's the danger in this trade? So, but, but let's talk a little bit about trading psychology. So believe it or not, all the things I spoke about contribute to your trading psychology, the confidence. How confident are you that you're recognizing that you're reading price action correct, that you got the trend, that you put your um, support resistance uh, in the right place? So all those things are technical skills, guys. This is the thing I want you to understand. If someone teaches you where to put support resistance levels and someone teaches you how to read the trend, your confidence grows. Because when you look at a chart, you become more confident that you are reading it correctly and therefore you are more likely to be trading in line with it. There's either an opportunity or there isn't. And if there is, now you know, okay, I've just got to find my entry and my stop loss. And now you understand that there are different places for stop losses and they're valid. But you also understand that you're not investing, you're trading, so you've got to take profit. So all that stuff together impacts your confidence. It's technical skills, it requires practice. <clears throat> It requires practice, it requires trying it, trying and failing, trying and failing until you until you start to get it correct, all right? Um, and trial and error is probably a better way of putting it. And it requires uh, a practice as well before you start to actually, I've taken 100 trades, I got it now, okay, you, I got the hang of it, so I'm reading it better. And all, you've got to improve in all those areas, reading trends, deciding where your stop loss is, where your entry should be, calculating your position size if you're risking 1% or half a percent. So the final thing that I want to add in on this with regards to trading psychology is that for me, and it also works for the people I've mentored in the past, so I know it works, is how much I risk per trade. There's a direct correlation between that and how my mindset is, how I feel. What that means is in your first 100 trades, you're probably going to do some really bad, make some bad decisions, really bad trade setups. You're going to misread the markets. You're going to, somebody told you they're long on gold and you like them and you like their opinion. So you've gone long on gold and maybe they took a bad trade that time. So you followed a bad trade. <clears throat> There's a whole lot of things. So the only thing that makes that worse in your first 100 trades where you're making terrible decisions and making mistakes is that you lose a lot of money and that is completely within your control. Let's assume your first 100 trades will be your worst 100 trades. After that, your next 100 trades won't be so bad. So let's assume that your first 100 trades are gonna be the worst, the most expensive, or the biggest mistakes you make. So why have that? You can choose how much that is. You could choose if you put one cent on each of those trades, or you demo trade them, or you, or you put 10 bucks on each trade. 
So your goal is really is to master the trade process, the technical analysis, the trade setup, identifying the trade, calculating a risk and taking it. It isn't really about the money. It's really about the process. It's almost like you shouldn't actually be able to trade with real money for your first 20 trades. And then when you get to your next 20 trades, you should start putting small amounts of money on it because that is another level that you have to unlock psychologically. So there is a direct correlation between how much money you put on a trade and your trading confidence, all right? If you lose a lot of money on a normal trade, it could be a good trade setup, could take that 100 times and 80 times out of 100, that trade would make money. You could have taken it exactly right, but then 20 times, maybe the market doesn't move that way. And so you lose money. So maybe there's one trade you take, you decide you've had losing trades, you're gonna go big, you're gonna risk 5% on this trade to make your money back, and it doesn't go your way. And it's not your fault, maybe it was a good trade setup, maybe it wasn't. And this time you lose five times your budget and you've already down 5% because of or whatever your budget was. Now you just, <clears throat> you become depressed and you want to quit. And all of that was completely avoidable by just dialing down the amounts until you get through your first 100 trades. By the time you get through your first 100 trades, you're not thinking about the money anymore, you're thinking about the trades. So everything you do is a habit. So what you want to do is start conditioning yourself, build the good habits now. Because there's a whole list of bad habits. Things like risking too much, revenge trading, switching directions because you're tired of trying to guess which or trying to read which way it's going to go, uh, moving your stop loss, adding to your losing position, all kinds of crazy stuff you do. And all those things put the odds against you. They make sure that you better be lucky that it's a winning trade because you've made everything harder for yourself. You become emotional. You become emotionally invested because now you've got to be right versus all the good habits, you know, taking your time, making sure you read the trend correctly, calculating a risk, assessing, you know, how much, where your emotional state is, being less emotional, all these different things that you have to try to work towards. And all you have to do is you can do all the right things in the one column and do one of the bad things in the other column and you can destroy your odds of success on that trade, on that trade. And everything you do becomes a habit. So if you do this once, you might just keep doing it. And then it's a habit. You're always revenge trading or you're always moving your stop loss. So your goal is to just, and that journey is the same for every single trade on the planet, but the, the time, how long it takes them to just stop messing around and doing the bad stuff and just doing the good stuff, that time varies. It might be three years for somebody and two years for another person. They just get to a point where they stop doing the bad things sooner. But it's interesting because the more you the, the more you do the good stuff, the faster you actually progress because now you don't have to worry about recovering from a losing trade where you did something stupid. Now you can just move on to the next part, which is identifying the good setup. So it, it also changes your focus. So the amount of money per trade will really cause you to spiral. So it's very smart to keep your risk small for your first set of trades. You decide what that is, 10 trades, 20 trades, but do that and then progress it. Ironically, you get from beginner to intermediate trader faster by just keeping your risk low on your first few trades. Oh, there we go. We've hit the time. Duk, 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 duk. <clears throat> so ladies and gentlemen, I hope you found that instructive and useful. If you have any questions to do with your accounts or to do with the platform, I really recommend that you get in touch with the lovely folks at Vantage Markets. They're always there to help you, always very helpful. I, they always literally are just here on the side in my WhatsApp. There's a WhatsApp group and they're going, how's it going? They're always curious and asking how everyone's doing it. Is everyone happy? Um, and if you have any questions to do that, again, my name is Adam Harris. I'm one of the traders with Trade with Precision. And uh, I hope that you have uh, found this instructive and useful and I'm going to let you go. So uh, that's it from me, ladies and gents. I'm going to end the streaming from OBS. I've stopped it. And I'm going to end the GoToWebinar webinar. But thank you, ladies and gents, and I look forward to seeing you in uh, future webinars. Thanks.